So if you've got a Bible, go ahead and get it out tonight. We're going to start in the Old Testament. If you can find the book of Micah, go ahead and get there. We're going to start there. And uh, I'll just say this. In preparing for this message tonight, I literally went through, I can't tell you how many ideas of, of how I could approach the gospel, of how I could approach this Christmas season. There, there's so many ways. I know many of you don't, don't think like a preacher, but like, you know, there's the gospel and you come back to it every year and you're like, well, people have heard this now if they've been in church. How do I present this in a new way? Lord, give me something new. And I thought about so many angles to approach the Christmas story from. And I thought about a lot of different things I could preach, and nothing felt right. And finally, I was just like, all right, Lord, I'm just going to be simple. I'm just going to give you some of what I've been seeing in my own personal study as I've been getting ready for this season tonight. This is not a, a message or a sermon so much as it's just me for the next few minutes sharing with you what I've seen in Scripture and sharing my heart and trusting God that he might do something with it. Is that all right? Because in this season, like, we don't, we don't really know when Jesus was born. Like, we don't actually know a date, right? So we, we've chosen this date, set, uh, December 25th. It's the day we celebrate Jesus. But there's a lot of theories about when it actually happened. I was talking to Ben about that earlier this week. It's interesting if you like pursuing down those things of when could he have actually been born. We don't even know a year. I mean, it's really an educated guess as to when Jesus was actually born born. But for whatever reason, in our calendars, in America, we're celebrating the birth of Jesus on December 25th. So in this season, I find myself just reflecting back. I would like to say we, as Christians, we, we keep the birth of Jesus in our heart always, you know. But especially in this season, I just like to see again the beauty and, and the glory, the wonder of what God has already done. So what I hope to do just in the next few minutes, and it's probably going to be a lot shorter than a lot of you guys are used to if you come here, is just share with you again, and if you've heard this before, for you to again maybe appreciate the, the depth and, and the beauty of what God has done through his son Jesus. Or if you're here, maybe you were drugged by a coworker, friend, family member, or you're watching online and somebody's making you watch, you hear this for the first time, I make no bones about it. I hope that you would believe in this Jesus that I'm talking about. I hope that you would come into having a relationship with him for the first time and that you would see is this not just some fickle fantasy that makes some people feel good, but that this is documented, that it's real, that there's substance to our faith, and that as Luke 1, 4 says, you can have certainty about what you've been taught because there's something underneath this faith that we have. So as we get into the Word, I just want to pray, and then we're going to read together. Is that okay? Father, I thank you that you're good. I thank you that your word's perfect. And I pray, Holy Spirit, in these next few moments that you just have your way. I pray that you would illuminate scripture to us. Lord, awaken dead hearts to hear truth for the first time. Lord, open our ears to hear, our eyes to see, and our hearts and minds to perceive truth from your word because we know that it's perfect and it's for our good, it's for our growing, and it's for our knowing you more fully. In Jesus' name, if you agree with that, say amen. Amen. So we're going to start in Micah chapter 5. Just one verse I'm going to start with here. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. It says, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth from me, or for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old from ancient days. So this is just one verse from this guy named Micah who was a prophet, an Israelite. He, he would prophesy things. He would tell things given to him from the Spirit of the Lord before they would happen, and then kings and other people would see these things come to pass. So these words were written centuries before the birth of Christ. And we know that even earlier we heard the reading from Luke that Jesus came to the town of Bethlehem to be born. So our Christ, our Savior, as he says, was born in Bethlehem. And he would come to be ruler not only in Israel, not only in the way of a traditional king, but 
to literally be over the people of God, to be the head. Now we are the body. But to me, this is interesting, and it's one of my favorite verses of what we see in the Old Testament is now fulfilled in the New, because it literally says, who's coming forth is from of old, or from ancient days. So this speaks to the uniqueness of Christ's birth, because how could somebody being born also be of old? How could somebody freshly coming into the world, into existence, also be an ancient of days? Well, John, in his first chapter of his gospel, kind of explains it to us. John, beginning in one one, says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So Jesus Christ, the Son, was in the beginning. Before time, if you go back to Genesis chapter 1, and you see the Spirit of God hovering over the waters, we see the Spirit existent before time. We see the Son existed before time. The Father, the one who orchestrated all these events, they co-eternally reign. It's this concept that I don't know if we can really grasp in our human minds fully, the concept of one God who exists in three persons, and he's three persons, but he's one God. But here is one of the things that points to it. Jesus Christ, the Son, is eternal. This is God. Jesus is God. So the Son is eternal. That means the Word is eternal. Jesus is eternal. But now there's this something going on that Mike has talked about. This is no regular birth here. Now, as John alludes to, there's this breaking forth that's happening, this bursting into humanity, because this is no regular birth like my birth and your birth. I mean, my mama remembers my birth. She'll tell you about it. I was actually uh, one of those people. I was a whole month late, a whole month. And then labor took three days. Like, I really liked it inside the womb, you know? Like, it was cozy. Like, my mama can tell you. She'll tell you how special I am. And I'm sure your mama would tell me how special you are. But this is a unique birthing. This is something that had not been seen as common to mankind It's this event that goes beyond what anybody would have imagined. Because John says just a little later on, he says, and the word became flesh. The word that was eternal. The word that existed back then, that was from old, that was ancient of days. He was coming into the world. He says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That means tabernacled amongst us. So in the Old Testament, when you would see the glory of God, tabernacling with his people. The fulfillment is Jesus. We've talked briefly, and I won't go deep into it, but you'd all so often see a type in the Old Testament, a figure, a person, a thing, an actual real event happen. And then you would see anti-type, a fulfillment in the New Testament that would be a more fuller fulfillment, if you would, of what was shown in the Old Testament. So in the Old Testament, we see the glory of God tabernacle with his people. Yet only certain ones could go in and be in his most holy of holies, in his presence. Now Jesus Christ comes and he will tabernacle with us. That's what that word means, dwelt with us. He literally came and lived among us in the flesh. And if we fast forward, you already know the end of the story. That when he was crucified, the curtain that separated in the temple where people would go to meet with God, was torn from the top to the bottom. The Son of Man crucified, signaling that now we could go in to be in the presence, the very real presence of God. Something that was kept from us in times past is now open to anyone who would come. So here's Jesus dwelling amongst us in the flesh. And it says, we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. So the word became flesh. The son became flesh like us. Here's how Philippians chapter two says it. He emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. 
And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So this is how he knows our struggle. It's because he lived in the flesh. He lived as a person. So every time you struggle, I'm not saying he's done your specific struggle, but he knows it. This is how he knows what it's like to feel pain. He knows what it's like to feel rejection. He knows what it's like to feel longing and abandonment. Like if you feeling pain is something you think nobody can identify with, if nobody else can, Jesus does. He came and he lived it. He lived and he experienced life as us, man, flesh, 100% man. So every situation you face, he knows your struggle. He's lived as a servant, it says, taking on that form, yet he has done perfectly what none of us could do. So this is where he begins to set himself apart, if it wasn't already apparent. Bursting into the world from an ancient of days, now he lives a sinless life. Jesus came and he did what none of us have done or could hope to do. He lives his life sinlessly, perfect, before the Father. And it's something that we can't do, but this is something I feel like doctrinally we don't go into much. And at Christmas, what better time? Even if we could live a perfect life, even if we could be sinless, it still wouldn't be enough. Even if you could think that you could achieve your way into being perfect. I could live a perfect and righteous enough life. I could serve enough people, give enough money away, do enough good things that I could be perfect before God. Even if you think you could, you still wouldn't be enough. Why? Because sin is in our nature. We're born with it. This is how Romans says it. Chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, that's Adam. Not me, but I sin too. Adam, one man, and death through him, because it was through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sin. So in the garden, let's go back to the beginning. Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3. God creates man in his image. Perfect relationship. No sin exists. And then mankind chooses to disobey the one commandment given by God. The one commandment given by God. We choose to disobey, and ever since, there has been this chasm. There has been this separation between a perfect God, who's perfect and righteous in every way, and mankind, who now, it says, sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin. So now, not only do we die a physical death, but we die an eternal, spiritual death. Everybody in this room, everybody listening, this is not a downer message on Christmas. This is reason for you to celebrate because all of us will be before God. And we will have one of two things happen. We will know Jesus and we will have eternal life in the presence of God or else we will have not accepted Jesus as Savior and we will not have eternal life in his presence. We will be separated from him for all eternity. Why? Because sin has consequences. The Bible says the penalty of sin is death. We see it here. And sin came in through one man. But then Romans 5.18 says, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. That act was the perfect sacrifice, Jesus on a cross, took my sin, your sin, the sin of all humanity once and for all time. He shed perfect blood once and for all so that my sin and your sin is washed away. It's the only way our sin could be paid for. The good news is this sin that was brought into you, even though you didn't maybe ask for it, it's in your flesh now. It's taken care of by Jesus Christ. By his death, his burial, and his resurrection. So we inherit this sin. It's in our nature. So it takes a rebirth. 
for us to be made different. It takes a rebirth. So that means when we accept Christ as Savior, we receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit now dwelling in us, regenerating our spirit because naturally we're sinful. Jesus is the only one who did it perfect. And I know it's Christmas and I know we like to talk about his birth, but how can we talk about Jesus without talking about his death? One event leads to the other. The birth is amazing, but without the death, it's incomplete. The death and the burial and the resurrection was amazing, but we can't miss this part at the birth either. Like one event leads to the other. I I need you guys to see that this is the center of all history. This is it. The birth, the life, the burial, the death, the resurrection of Jesus, everything hinges on this. Everything. And his birth was miraculous. See, okay, let's just read this. I told you I'll read things. I'm trying not to preach much tonight. Matthew chapter 1, 18 through 25. He didn't have sinful flesh as we did. I need you to see this. He was born of a virgin. Okay? Let's just read it. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. So what's in her is conceived supernaturally. It's what we believe. Yes, we believe that there was a God who sent his son Jesus who died on a cross. We also believe in a miraculous virgin birth. We believe in these supernatural things. Why? Because the Bible attests to it. Why? Because it fulfills prophecy upon prophecy upon prophecy. We see over and over again these things attested to in Scripture. It says she was with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, Do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you should call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place, get this, to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. See, the virgin birth is a key doctrine. For if Jesus Christ is not God come in sinless flesh, then we do not have a savior. Because if he was in flesh, Human flesh, sinful, he was no perfect sacrifice. If he was but a man, only a man, 100% man, and had human flesh and that's it, even if he lived perfectly, he had inherited sin, now his sacrifice on the cross is not enough. But we see here something different. We see that he was not just born into the world, but he was born from heaven and came into the world. So he was sent by the Father and therefore came into the world, yes, having a human mother, but having no father born of the will of a father that conceived him. So we see a perfect virgin womb, 100% man, but also 100% God. God with us, it says. Emmanuel. Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel look like? What does God with us look like? God with us. It's like having peace when everybody thinks that you should be falling apart. It's like having joy when tragedies hit your family. That's what it looks like to have a God that's with us, tabernacles, dwells with us. It's like loving that person that hurt you so bad. It's like having a God who touches you and now your cancer's gone when they gave you a bad report earlier. It's like having a brother-in-law who fell and I didn't know if he'd live and now he's sitting right here in the second row. God with us. A God that stays with us. It's this theme that runs from Old Testament 
to new. Matthew picks it up in chapter 1, and he, he goes all the way back to another prophecy that we won't get into now, but was from centuries earlier. He says all of this was to fulfill what was spoken so that he would be called Emmanuel. God with us. He starts there in chapter 1, and it runs through his whole narrative. Matthew 28, we read it all the time. We usually stop in verse 18 and 19 because it talks about making disciples. That's our vision. That's our mission as a church. Let's start in 19, but let's read it the whole way because we again see God with us opening the narrative and closing the narrative. It says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And Jesus closes that whole gospel by saying, and behold, I am with you, what? Always. I am with you always. God with us to the end of the age. You go in Revelation chapter 21, I think it's verse 6. It says, now God dwells with his people. It's the eternal state that we now look forward to. That's what God with us is, Emmanuel. This is God with us. It's Jesus. That's what Christmas is. It's Jesus. It's the Christ of God coming into the world, robed in flesh, experiencing everything we've experienced, yet sinning not. Doing it in a way that would have baffled anybody's minds. And it's at this time of year that we just hopefully take a moment to pause, to reflect, to be thankful, and to see that we have a God who's with us, that dwells with us in a way that makes no sense to the world. And no matter how 2022 played out for you, I can tell you this. If you know Emmanuel, I can promise you the best is yet to come. He has plans for you. (laughs) His joy is for you. His peace is for you. And his love eternal is with you. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for sending your son, the Christ. I thank you for loving us with a love that's everlasting and eternal. I thank you for giving to us in a way that is incomprehensible to give your own son. Lord, I just want to thank you for it today. I want to dwell upon the majesty and the wonder of it today. And Lord, for anybody that's listening in this room, anybody watching online later, Lord, I pray that you would reveal yourself. And if you're watching right now, you're listening right now, I just want to lead you in a prayer. Every head still bowed, every eye still closed. If you do not know Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life, you can do that right now. I'm going to give you the words to say. You give them the meaning. And I believe that God will do a miracle in your heart in this moment, and it will change your entire eternity. So everybody pray out loud. Let's pray together. Let's say, dear God, in Jesus' name, I come to you. I thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. I confess that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. Jesus, come and be my Savior. I turn from my sins, and I follow you. Come be the Lord of my life. I believe that Jesus Christ died on a cross for my sins, and that he was buried, and that he was resurrected. Thank you for loving me. Uh, (laughs) Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that, you just made the best decision of your life. If you're in this room, please find me afterwards. I'd love to talk with you. Just get to hear your story, give some next steps, get to know you a little bit. If you're watching, call that number that's on the screen. There's people who want to talk to you right now. If you guys would just stand, we're going to close with one more song tonight that just reflects upon the beauty of the gospel narrative. Uh, I don't know about you, but these old hymns, Some I can take or leave, quite honestly. But this is one of my favorite songs because it's so rich with gospel truth. It's so true. And man, these guys singing it, it's really good to hear y'all sing it too. So we're going to sing along and just give all of our worship, all of our honor to Jesus tonight.